Hello there, this is Mr. Ho, your FA lecturer. Well, in today's video, I'm going to teach you how to solve a doing a statement of cash flows using the direct method. Again, I'll be using the example that's found in your lecture notes. And for those who need uh, to hear it again, this is also a, <clears throat> a good opportunity to do so, so that it will further help you understand how to prepare Statement of cash flows using the direct method. So here we have Dolly Private Limited. Right, that's the case study. Uh, here is Dolly's uh, statement of financial position or balance sheet. So you have your assets there, you have your liabilities, and of course your OE. So the OE of this company is for 2012 is 722,472 for 2011. And then here we have the profit and loss or statement of comprehensive income for the year ended 2012 and here you have a net profit, sorry. Here we have a net profit of 84,000. And further breakdown of the statement of OE, and you have additional information, additional information here. All right. First up, when we do a direct method, okay. Although the question here is both direct and indirect, I'm just going to focus on the direct method. First thing to know about cash flows, as I mentioned during lectures, is to firstly work out what are the cash and cash equivalents, because if we can identify them then we can be sure that that is the change of cash flow that's taken place for the year. So where do we go to identify what are the CCE or cash and cash equivalents, CCE for short? Well, if you look at the balance sheet, you should look at both the assets and the liabilities. So for the assets, if you look here, looks like the only CCE here is the cash at bank, right? That's the only CCE item. So that's the 250,000. As for liabilities, any CCE items? Yes, there's another one, right? The bank overdraft. So bank overdraft is a liability. So the net CCE for 2012 should be take the 250,000 minus away the 59,000. So when we do that, that will be the closing CCE, right? Cash and cash at 31st trip. Of course, the balance sheet are on this date. So if I take those, take the cash at bank minus the overdraft at that date, it will give me a net position of 191. But how about the opening CCE? To get the opening CCE, you must look at last year's closing balances. Last year. Because last year's closing will be 2012's opening. So last year's closing, if, uh, if you look at the assets, again, the only CCE item here is the 209,000 of the cash at bank and the other CCE item is the 50,000 bank overdraft. So the net position of the CCE at the beginning of 2012 which is the ending of 2011 would be by taking the 2009 minus away the 50,000 and that will give you there the 2019 minus 50,000 that will give you the 159,000. So which means there is a increase, right, from a 159 to 191, and the increase is 32,000. So with that in mind, we can then do up so-called the statement of cash flows first. So I'm about to scroll down. By the way, uh, this is the format of the cash flow, right, the name of the company, followed by the title, statement of cash flows, and then followed by the year that you're doing for the year ended 31st December 2012. And as you know, the cash flow is made up of three changes in uh, cash flows in three activities, beginning with the operating, followed by the investing, followed by the financing. But as I mentioned, when you do a cash flow, first up, you need to do both, is to see the change of cash in the cash, in the cash and cash equivalents, which is the CCE, right? So. in the CCE. So uh, just now we'll work out at it to be 159,000 and the closing is 191 
So the change was an increase, right? That's why we word it as a net increase. A net increase what is thirty two thousand. You follow? Okay, that's the format. So we're doing it uh, in a sense bottom up. Right? So we work out what is the closing, what is the opening, so there must there was a increase of the two thousand. So once we know that we have identified this correctly, we can be pretty sure and comfortable that this portion here is correct. Right? Once we are pretty assured of that, <coughs> we can then now move on to do the other um, activities. Some of you may like to now proceed this way. After doing this, you can do the financing and then you can do the investing and then followed by operating. You can also do that fashion or you can do from this way down. Also can, right? So whichever way doesn't matter. But the approach I'm going to teach you now is I'm going to look at the uh, operating activities first, right? So to do that, I need to firstly work out my cash receipts from customers. Actually, I have that because I run a business. So I must have cash receipts from customers. Now to work out for cash receipts from customers, in our FA module, we will assume that all sales are on credit. On credit. So this sales figure here, right, are on credit, which means <coughs> we sell people and people owe us the money. But we want the actual cash receipts. So how can we uh, work it out? Well, to work it out, we must understand what's the double entry when we do a credit sales. When we do a credit sales, the double entry is debit account receivable, right? As you can see here in the balance sheet, debit account receivable, credit, credit sales, right? But this doesn't show the amount that we receive. So the amount we receive would be when our account receivable pay us the money. So we should then credit account receivable, right? Which then is to credit account receivable. So we will be crediting account receivable and debit cash at bank, right? So which means, if you think about it, we can track the account receipts with the movement within account receivable. So in the T format, the account receivable, pardon my, uh, it's hard to write with this uh, <coughs> mouse, so account receivable. So the opening balance here, we can see, so 15,000, right? 15,000. And the closing balance is 12,000. Right? So beginning of the year, we started with 15,000. At the end of the year, we started with 12,000. But during the year, we sold 96,000 worth of sale. So, and these sales are all on credit, so it would be debit account receivable, credit sales. So debit account receivable, so that would be, <coughs> excuse me, 975,000 975,000 Can you see? So that means we have the remainder of this 12k, right? So the difference therefore should be here, right, in the credit and this difference would be the amount that we receive from the debtors So that would be a cash receipts from debtors So the formula then is take the opening balance plus any more credit sales home people owe you more, which is uh, 990, right? But at the, end of the, at the end of the day, at the end of the accounting year, you are left with 12,000. So which means how much did you receive? Please just take 15 plus 975 minus away the 12K. So, and you will get, it's already recorded here in your notes. Can you see? The 15,000 at your 97, Minus your 12, so the cash which is at the end of the day is 978. Once you are able to obtain that figure, the 978,000, you then place it here under cash receipts from customers. Alright? Now I know it's a bit intimidating, there seems like a lot of steps, but the more cash flows you do, uh, after a while you will get used to it. So once we have uh, finished doing that, I would recommend that you would take off the items so that you don't 
uh, double count so I already kind of tick off here so don't tick, uh, don't select that account again and also tick off the sales yes that's right the next thing is to then work out other than cash receipts from customers if you think about it when you operate a company is you also have payments right to your suppliers right payments to supplier so if cash receipt from customer we we got that by working with the account receivable account how about cash payment to suppliers well cash payment to suppliers should be movement within our opposite account receivable is accounts payable right the movement between these two 52,000 and 60,000 so what we had in the beginning was opening balance would be 60,000 right and the ending is 52 but during the year we would have purchased right do some purchases that will increase our accounts payable so we must take our 60,000 minus our sorry plus our purchases minus our closing right to get the cash uh, payments from suppliers so this 60,000 so if I draw the T up right this 60,000 remember is a liability liabilities are credit in nature so 60k will be here right sorry so let me write down this accounts payable P for payable right and our closing balance now here will be 52k we now need to work out the payments for the year which is here right because you would debit this account credit cash at bank but before we can do that we need to work out how much is the credit purchases for the year right now if we look at our statement of comprehensive can we find the purchases no right there's no purchases why because this uh, is not we are not using the you can't see the purchases because uh, it's hidden in the cost of goods sold all right so that's why that's why we need to work out remember what's the formula for cost of goods sold inside here what's the formula for cost of goods sold cost of goods sold c o g s the formula is if you remember from your PACC days is opening stock right opening inventory inventory plus your purchases minus your closing stock or inventory that's how you get cost of goods sold now you already know your cost of goods sold is 660,000 right and you need to work out your purchases so to work out purchases you need to also therefore work out how much opening inventory and closing inventory here is so the opening inventory is here which is last year's sorry opening inventory is here 160,000 closing inventory is 130,000 right so 160 will be here 160 and 130,000 closing inventory so now that you know from this formula you you have there are four elements right and you only have three items here you can then work out purchases so purchases therefore will be you will see here clearer purchases therefore will should be your COGS bring this over so minus opening stock bring this over so be plus closing stock and just now we got all those figures from the balance sheet and also from the statement of compensation income pack the figures in and you'll get the purchases of 630,000 so once we know our purchases is 630,000 we can then plug it here plug it here the 630,000 for purchases so from once we have this figure we can then work out this figure right so it's 60 plus 630,000 will be 690 690 minus 52 that will be our cash payment to suppliers as you can see here so cash payment is this the 690,000 minus the 52 just now I mentioned so it gives us a 638,000 so for this uh, cash payments to suppliers there's more steps involved where you need to interact with both the COGS right formula as well as the accounts payable movement
So this counts your practice. You know the formulas from your PACC days, so you just need to practice. All right. So once you get that figure, you can then plug in your cash payments to suppliers. Okay, six hundred. It's a payment. So payment is a cash outflow. So to show an outflow, you put in brackets. All right, so that you know you need to minus it off. Okay, the next thing is to ask yourself: Are there any uh, cash? Other cash payments or cash receipts. So to find out, you need to what you need to do is look at your statement of comprehensive income. In your statement of comprehensive income, you have already dealt with the cost of goods sold. You have already dealt with the sales. Uh, if you look at operating expenses here and other income, oh, there is some item here, right here and here. So we need to read the details to find out what they are. But looking at the more obvious items, you see that operating expense is a big item there. So that's obvious. So we need to deal with operating expenses. So to remember, this is a statement of comprehensive income, which means all the items here are on a cruel basis, meaning only revenue that's earned are recorded, only expenses that incurred are recorded. It does not capture the cash movement. Right? It captures the expenses and revenue recorded so that's the difference huh? now you're doing a cash flow so we know the expenses relating to operating is 198,000 now we need to work out the cash outflow for those operating expenses now to work the cash outflow we need to consider uh, the balance sheet items that are linked to operating expenses now to help you do that I've already um, work out a f formula for you to calculate and the formula is here right which is take the operating expenses plus the movement of the op accrued expenses all right where you take the opening minus the closing of the accrued expenses plus right the prepaid expenses and this time because it's prepaid, it's the other way around. The movement must be the closing minus the opening. So you, you add up all this, then you must minus the non-cash operating expenses. All right, Then you get the actual cash movement. I know for this one, the formula is crazy. But there's logic to it. All right, It's logic to it. So for example, let me give one logic. Explain the logic to you. Huh? If let's say, let me draw it here. If let's say I have a, a, a crude expense, for example, a crude expense here. Oh, it's very hard to write. Let me use my hand. A crude expenses. All right. A crude expenses by nature is a liability, right? So a liability, you, you write on the credit side, right? So on the credit, we know that the opening balance is, if you look at the balance sheet, the opening balance is 90, the closing is 13. So the opening is 19. Opening is 19K. Remember, it's a liability, so it's a credit side. Closing is 13K. Right? So because it's a liability, any payments will be on the debit side, right? So that's why we're looking for the payments. But any uh, current year accrual will be on the uh, credit side, correct? Because the end double entry will be debit operating expenses, credit accrued expenses. So we know that operating expenses recorded during the year is 193,000. So you'll place your 193,000 here, right? which means this is able to work out the cash movement. That is why the formula states this way. Operating expenses, which is this one, plus the opening expenses minus the closing expenses. Can you see? That's how we get the cash movement. And similarly, for the prepaid expenses, the logic is the same. Prepaid expenses is just opposite. Because with prepaid expenses, P for prepaid, E for expenses, I write short form easier. Prepaid expenses, the opening balance, if you look at the balance sheet, 
sorry, just now inventory we have dealt with it, so put a tick. So for prepaid expenses, this one so you dealt with it, put a tick, we have dealt with this. For prepaid expenses, it was a 6,000 and 8,000, right? Opening 8, closing 6. So prepaid is a debit in nature, it's an asset. So opening was 6,000, right? Or opening was 8,000. Let me check again, sorry. <coughs> prepaid expenses, opening was 8, closing was 6. So opening is a debit balance. So opening is a 8K. Uh, 6K was closing balance, 6K. So for, for that is why you drop by 2K. It's not a cash payment increase, but a cash decrease in your payments. So if it's a decrease, that's why it's a negative 2K. Can you see? That's, the, that's why we put closing minus opening. Because if we put opening minus closing, it will be a positive 2K. Positive 2K means suggest cash payment increase. But actually, in fact, cash payments has decreased, right? Because you started off with 8,000. Now you end up with a lower prepaid amount. So more less cash have come out. So there's less cash payment. That's why it's a negative, so minus 2K. All right? Now, once we have done that, we must also remove any non-cash items in our cash or in our operating expenses. So to find out what are the non-cash items, we need therefore to look at any clues given in this case study that suggests otherwise, uh, suggests the case. I mean. So that brings us to our additional information. For additional information, can you see here point number four? Included in operating expenses is depreciation and loss on sale of equipment. Now, these two items are non-cash in nature, right? and they are 8K and 1K each. They are non-cash in nature, and that's why and it's sitting inside our operating expenses, sitting inside here. So it's sitting in this figure. Because it's, they are non-cash, we must remove them, because here we are doing cash flow. We only want actual cash movements. So to remove them, we must minus out. That's why we minus depreciation and minus loss on sale equipment. Once we minus these two, this will give you our actual cash payment for operating expenses. 178,000. Oops, sorry. 178,000. So uh, we must go down to the cash flow. And finally, we get the cash payment to supplier 178,000. Again, this step involves so many accounts, so it's quite tedious. So again, it comes with practice. The more you do, the better you become. Right? And finally, you get cash generated from operations. Because right? in this example, uh, the 1,000 member, as I told you earlier on, is not an operating item, or it's not a strictly operating item, although it's still found the operating expenses. But we are told that in the additional information, See the other income, it refers to interest income. And interest income, as I mentioned during lectures, is an IDT item, right? Additional disclosure items, which are for interest. IDT stands for interest, dividend, and uh, taxes. So this is an IDT item. So for IDT items, we must disclose them separately. right? So if you look at your statement of cash flow, And here it is, right? So you are told just now, an additional note, this, uh, there's an interest received. Uh, and of course, uh, sorry, then as you look at the data given to us in this case study, there are also interests. So you know that's the next IDT items. And you know there are taxes paid, taxes incurred, which means there should be a taxes paid as well, if you did pay during the year. <clears throat> so we know these are the other two IDT items, right? So for interest expense, again, this is the expense amount. We need to find the cash amount. So to find the cash amount, <clears throat> we need to uh, find 
See if there's any balance sheet item relating to the interest expense. Ah, and here it is. See? So we've, again, we must repeat the movement within the accrued interest account. So the movement will be any movement would show the cash payments, right? So we start off with opening balance. We owe $1,000, right? And then we incurred expense of 2000 so we must add to that 2000 Now we owe $3,000. Assuming the interest expense is credit nature, which normally is the case. So we owe $3,000, but we end up eh, owing only $2,000, right? So which means there's a $1,000 movement. So there's a cash payment of $1,000. So can you see here? It's here. All right? 1000 So interest paid is $1,000. Paid, so it's negative in nature. How about interest? Sorry, I skipped the interest received. Let's go back to interest received. As for the interest received, we are told in the additional information, this $1,000 is interest, right? Or, or interest income. So ask yourself, is there any balance sheet item the rates to other income, if not, it would also, which means that would equal interest uh, received since there's no accrual for it. <coughs> so, interest income $1,000. Where is it? Interest income, all right. So, you even the accrual you must expect in a, is in the assets, but can you see here there's nothing to indicate uh, there's any accrual of of the uh, income or prepayment of the income. So if that's the case, this $1,000 here should be the actual uh, movement of cash, which is the cash received. There you go. See? That's why it's also $1,000. There's no accrued interest income. So once you have that figure, you put interest received one thousand dollars, interest paid one thousand dollars. That leaves us with the income tax paid. Income tax paid. So the tax that we owe is thirty-seven thousand dollars, right? I mean, uh, that we incurred is thirty-seven thousand. Sorry, it's kind of pretty messy here so let me uh, delete should I delete all ink yeah for now it's because pretty messy so now the tax here is 37,000 incurred right so 37,000 dollars tax uh, again we look at the assets and liabilities see anything relating to tax yes tax payable right which is here so beginning of the year we didn't owe anything and then during the year, we incurred $37,000, but at the end of the year, we only left 12000 to pay. So there's some kind of movement. So we did pay a certain amount, right, which is 25000 if I'm not mistaken. Right, 37 minus 12. Yes, 25000 So the cash income tax paid is 25000 Okay, once you're finished with that, you ask yourself, is there any other operating activities? The best way to look at it is look at your statement of comprehensive income. Remember, I should tell you to tick off for the items you have done. We have done sales, we have done COGS, we have done other income, we have done operating expenses, we have done interest, we have done the taxes. Any more items we didn't cover? No, we covered everything. Yay, which means there is no more operating expenses including IDT items. And for the balance sheet, please also tick off the items you have done. This is under CCE, this is under cash receipts, this is under the cash payment to suppliers, this is under cash payment to operating expenses, this is under CCE, this is under cash payments to suppliers, this is under cash payment to operating expenses, this was interest paid, this was covered under tax paid. So we're almost there. We have done, looks like, two-thirds or more of the items. So as you can see, it's usually the operating expenses one that takes up the longest time. Yeah. So you need requires patience to do this portion. 
So once you have finished with the last item, you can finally get the net cash position of the operating expense activities. In this case, it's a, it's a positive uh, figure. It's positive, so the net cash must be from operating, not use. See this one here? Use means it's a negative. Positive means net cash from operating activities. All right? Done. Woohoo! Okay, next, let's look at the investing activities. Now, for investing activities, it usually refers to activities... Uh, they relates to long-term assets, as we have seen in our notes, right? So long-term assets are usually uh, property, plant equipment, or fixed assets. So in this example, can you see we have land here as a fixed asset? We also have equipment, right, as a asset. And that's it. No other uh, investing. I think, oh sorry, maybe we have a debenture there as well. If you look here. Sorry, debenture is a financing activities. Alright, so investing are just the, uh, what you invest. Could be in fixed assets or in other instruments. I guess debenture here is a liability. So it can be an uh, investment. Investment normally is an asset in nature. So it's a financing. Alright, so land, 180000 Sorry, you started off with 80,000 in the beginning of the year, you end up with 180. So there was an increase of 100. Did you buy? If you buy, then it's a cash uh, payment, right? For purchasing land. But did you buy the land? Double check. Look at the additional information. Is there any, there any mention of the land? Yes, look at additional information number three. Now look. With regards to acquiring the land, this hundred thousand dollars was not paid by cash. How was it financed? Maybe finance is not a good word. It might be a confusing term to use. But how did we get the where did we get the money to pay the land? We got the money money actually by uh, actually we didn't get any money but rather we exchange it. Can you see? We exchange it for shares in our companies. So this, as you can remember, is known as a non-cash transaction. So as a non-cash transaction, it will not appear in our cash flow statement. All right, but this will help us account for the change in land. So we know the hundred k. Why is changed the hundred k here? Yeah, the hundred k. We know why how it's changed. So we put a tick, but it's not a cash uh, item, so we don't include our cash flow. And we know it's raised to our share capital. See, can you notice our share capital increased by 100,000? Here? Yeah. So it's a non cash item. But I put a tick to show that we we'll account for it. Next is to look at our uh, other long term assets, in this case, the equipment. And for the equipment, we had none to begin with, right? And then we bought, we ended up 160. So we, did we spend 160,000 on equipment? No. Before we, we conclude that, let's check out the additional information. Now, notice in our additional information, there was equipment of 20,000 that was sold. Right? And it looks like it's a trade in. Oh, no, not trade in. It was uh, uh, sold in for cash for 17,000. And the netbook value at the time of the sale was 18,000. So if the netbook was 18, you sold it for 17, you can straight away see here a loss of $1,000, right? There was a loss of $1,000, 1K, right? This loss of $1,000 is the, see, it ties in nicely with this $1,000 here, is the loss on sale equipment. And this loss on sale equipment we already accounted for, right? But what we need to be aware now is how does this information affect our movement, our movement in the in the uh, equipment account. So in the equipment account, if I again use the T for easier to easier to see. If not, you can still use linear way of looking at it. So for asset, it's a debit nature, right? You started with nothing, you ended up with 16k as a closing balance. 
So you thought you spent 160k, but notice you sold in the middle of the year, you did sell off 20,000 worth of equipment. Right? Can you see here? 20,000. So you sold this 20,000, so it must be a credit. If you sold it for 20,000, 20, I mean 20,000 worth of assets were sold away, not worth, uh, and you still remain 160, so how many did you purchase during there? It must be 180. Right? 180. So that's why when you look here, in this uh, presentation here, See, it's hundred eighty thousand, right? So that will that payment that is a payment, right? So that's why you put here. You would phrase it as purchase of equipment, as an as a payment. So it's a negative hundred eighty thousand. Then we also told that we sold it, remember, for seventeen thousand. Yeah, sold it for seventeen thousand. To sell this means cash comes in, right? So it's debit, cash, credit. Uh, loss on disposal. So seventeen thousand is the cash inflow. And you phrase it as proceeds from sale equipment. You had negative and your inflow, the net position is still a net outflow and since net outflow is now net cash use in investing activities. Alright? So we're done. Oh yeah, so if you're wondering, a hey, teacher, how about the, remember the accumulated depreciation? So if you come here, how about the accumulated depreciation? Now the accumulated depreciation, can you see we started with zero, nothing, and we end of the year with 16, right? So you look at the accumulated depreciation. By the way, accumulated depreciation is a non-cash, non-cash item, right? So we actually don't have to worry about it, but for completeness sake, I just want to show to you how it's accounted for, all right? So accumulated depreciation. Now accumulated depreciation by nature is a negative uh, balance, sorry here, negative, uh, sorry, the credit balance. So we started the, off the year with zero, but we end off the year with 16,000, right? But remember, we, <coughs> excuse me, excuse me, <coughs> had a net book value of 18,000, right, that we got rid of. As you know, net book value, the formula is cost, which is 20,000, minus accumulated. So minus whatever this figure is, will give you 18,000, right? So what's our accumulated? Accumulated is 2, right? And this 2 was disposed. So when it's disposed, the 2K must come out of accumulated, right? To come out and out, you must debit, right? So which means how much accumulated depreciation, uh, or how much depreciation was incurred that, that year? It's 18,000. So if you expect an 18,000 in our statement of comprehensive income. I think we can't see it straight up, so we'll look at additional information. Was it 18,000? Yeah, see? Our additional information tells us, sorry, tells us that Indeed, the deposition was $18,000. Alright? So by showing you that, I've accounted for the accumulated deposition. Hooray! So all the items here have been accounted for. All the liabilities have been accounted for except debentures. Ordinary share capital is accounted for. So we only left with two more items to account for. And then we're done with the cash flow. So let's move on. As for additional information, we have looked at items uh, 2, items 3, done, 4, done, 5, done, so left item 1. And guess what's relating to the debentures? And we're told the debentures were issued in cash. So let's look at our debentures. Our debentures, yeah, we start off the year with nothing. Then we issue 90,000. And this 90 was in cash, so it should be a inflow, right? So the venture should be a 90,000 inflow.
and I said debenture is a investing activity, sorry, financing activity. So we put it under here. Proceeds from issue of debentures, 90,000. All right. So now that we have done with uh, all the, sorry, the assets and liabilities are counted for. We now, and also ordinary check account, now we're left with retained earnings. So we need to look at the movement of retained earnings to see if there's any of the movement relates to cash flow movement. So for retained earnings, guess what? Uh, in some examples, the movement are not given to us, so we need to piece together the movement based on the additional information given to us and all the information. So for the, for the retained earnings, can you see here there's a movement of it started off with 42,000, end off in 94. And the movement is due to uh, net profit after tax of 84,000, which is from here. That's a totally non-cash in nature, so we ignore that. Uh, and also, it's a result of dividends of 32,000. That gives, then gives us a right to 94,000. So this dividends, all right, when in, in a cash flow example, you have to assume there is cash in nature. It can't be share dividend anyway because the share capital has been accounted for. So therefore, and there's no dividend payable account, so therefore it has to be a cash in nature. Right? So if that's the case, paying out dividends is a financing activity. So that's a cash dividend. 32,000. Right? Okay? So once you've done that, there's a net cash position of uh, as positive of eight thousand. This is positive. We have to say as net cash from financing activities. Now, guess what? After all that hard work, finally, the moment of truth. Because after all that hard work, right? You got to add up all these three items, and all these three items must be the same as thirty-two thousand. So take 138,000 minus 163 plus 58. If it's not 32,000, then you know you've done something wrong. But if it is, but if it is 32,000, jump for joy and say, hooray, I got it right. Right? So in the exam, if you, let's say, add this three and get 31,000, don't change this, 30, this to 31,000, no? Because you know for sure that this is correct. So this is, cannot be altered unless, of course, your calculation here is wrong. Because you identify your CCE wrongly or you calculate wrongly, then your net here will be different. But if you are very sure this is right, then something here must be wrong. So if I were you, what I'll do is I could be work backwards, right? Meaning, I will comb through this first. If I'm very sure this is right, then I know this figure is right. If I'm very sure that this is right, then I know this is right. Which means I know this is a balancing figure, 137,000. But of course. Your details here must be right in order to get to this 137,000. Alright, so that's some of the tricks you can consider using. Now I know, uh, as you look at this, it's quite taxing to do and I guess if you've been attending lectures, this is not your first time listening. So this video is meant for you to revise what I covered during lectures. Right? And I guess with the advantage of video, what you could do is for every segment or every part that I explain, what you could do is you pause. And if we don't understand, we play it again. If you don't understand, we play it again. All right? Until you understand. And I hope this will give you a very good hands-on approach and understanding to do how to do staff statement of cash flows using the direct method. All right? That's all, and I'll see you around in, in school. Take care. Bye-bye.